I think my greatest success was the two-stage uh, supercharger on the Merlin. That I did do myself. And I proposed it, I specified it, I did all the calculations, we made it, and it worked first pop. It puts 70 miles now on the speed of the Spitfire and 10,000 feet on its fighting altitude. The Impossible Promise, January 1938. A 29-year-old mathematician walks into the Rolls-Royce factory in Derby, England. Well, it was in uh, January 1938, early in January 1938. And I remember on one of the usual miserable, cold, dark, damp days, you know, when I walked up uh, Nightingale Road in Derby to be interviewed by Lord Hyde over there. Stanley Hooker carries a doctorate from Oxford in fluid dynamics, but he's never designed an engine in his life. The senior engineers eye him with suspicion. He's an academic, a theorist, someone who works with equations on paper rather than steel and fire. Within 18 months, this mathematician will make a promise so audacious it could either save the Royal Air Force or destroy his fledgling career. Britain stands on the precipice of war. The Merlin engine powering every frontline Spitfire and Hurricane is good, but not good enough. German Messerschmitt fighters can climb higher and dive faster. RAF pilots are being outmaneuvered in their own skies. Rolls-Royce needs 30% more power from the Merlin. They need it immediately. Every traditional engineer says it cannot be done without a complete redesign that would take years. Hooker studies the blueprints for weeks. He fills notebooks with calculations exploring airflow dynamics through the supercharger. Then he walks into Ernest Hives' office and makes his promise. He can deliver the power increase, not in years, in months. Here's what nobody knew at the time. For more and more horsepower. And so it is to the turbine engine over here that we have to turn for the delivery of the start. These are the basic casings of the engine, opened up for your inspection. And over here, we have the inside components which really produce the power. Hooker lied, not about the mathematics, those were sound, but about his certainty. He was betting Britain's air defense on theoretical calculations that had never been tested in metal. If his equations were wrong, if he had miscalculated even slightly, the modified engines could tear themselves apart at altitude sending pilots spiraling to their deaths with no chance of recovery. But Hooker believed in his numbers with the fervor of a man. We went on developing the engine, and um, then we, we were told by the ministry to, to design an engine of 4,000 pounds of thrust, uh, which is a big step up, twice the thrust. Who understood that sometimes you must act before you're certain, because waiting for certainty means defeat. This is the story of how mathematical intuition and calculated risk saved the free world, the gentleman's engine. The Rolls-Royce Merlin began life as the PV-12, a private venture 12-cylinder engine developed in the early 1930s. It was, in every sense, a Rolls-Royce product. Elegant, precision-built, engineered with the same attention to detail the company lavished on their luxury motor cars. 12 cylinders arranged in a perfect 60-degree V configuration, liquid-cooled, supercharged. By 1936, the production Merlin was generating just over a thousand horsepower and was selected to power two revolutionary fighter designs, the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire. Pilots loved the Merlin. It was smooth, reliable, and powerful enough to make the Spitfire one of the most graceful aircraft ever to take flight. But as Europe slid toward war, a troubling reality emerged during combat evaluations. The German Daimler-Benz engines in the Messerschmitt BF 109 had superior high altitude performance. German engineers had extracted every possible advantage through advanced supercharging and fuel injection technology. Squadron leader Peter Townsend described early encounters with German fighters over France as exercises in frustration. British pilots would engage at 20,000 feet only to watch Messerschmitts climb away effortlessly to 25,000 feet, then dive back down with the advantage of height and speed. The Merlin was running out of breath in the thin air at altitude. Its single-stage supercharger, designed for efficiency at medium altitudes, simply couldn't compress enough oxygen into the cylinders at extreme heights. Rolls-Royce engineers proposed solutions. Better fuel mixtures, incremental supercharger improvements, careful adjustments to boost pressure. All were the ideas, but all requiring two to three years of development and testing. By mid-1938, it was becoming clear that Britain didn't have three years. They might not have three months. The Mathematical Maverick. Stanley George Hooker was born in 1907 to a farm laborer's family in Sheerness. He won scholarships through sheer intellectual ability, first to Imperial College London, then to Oxford for a doctorate in fluid dynamics. When Ernest Hives hired him in late 1937, the traditional Rolls-Royce engineers were baffled. 
What use was a mathematician in an engine factory? Engines were built through experience and accumulated wisdom, not equations. Hives told Hooker to explore the factory and find something interesting. Hooker found the supercharger development section. He studied the Merlin's test data and saw something that made him pause. The airflow readings didn't match his fluid dynamics predictions. The intake duct crammed at the engine's rear looked as he later wrote, very squashed. The turbulent airflow was wasting energy. Senior engineers dismissed his concerns. Better to accept 90% efficiency than risk everything chasing perfection. But Hooker kept calculating, seeing a pathway that would require convincing skeptical men to trust a mathematician they barely knew. The dangerous experiment. Here's what happens when supercharger design goes wrong. In 1939, during high altitude testing, a pilot experienced catastrophic detonation at 18,000 feet. The fuel air mixture exploded instead of burning smoothly. Pressure waves hammered through the combustion chamber like cannon fire. The pilot barely glided back as oil pressure plunged to zero. Post-incident inspection revealed chunks of aluminum piston punched through the cylinder wall. But Hooker examined that destroyed engine with fascination rather than fear. The detonation pattern didn't match conventional predictions, suggesting the theoretical models were incomplete, which meant room for improvement existed that traditional engineers couldn't see. He requested a test engine. Senior engineers refused. Too risky. Hooker went directly to Ernest Hives, presenting calculations with more confidence than he possessed. He made it sound inevitable, mathematical, certain. Hooker lied, not about the mathematics, but about the certainty of translating theory into metal. Hives, desperate and impressed, overruled his engineers. Hooker got his test engine. Now he had to prove his equations worked in reality. The breakthrough secret. Hooker treated air as a fluid with specific mathematical properties. Sharp corners create turbulence that wastes energy. Smooth curves maintain laminar flow and maximize efficiency. He redesigned the intake duct as a smoothly curved pathway, then optimized the impeller vanes using mathematical models of blade angles and fluid velocity. His real genius was the diffuser design, calculating exact angles to recover pressure energy previous designs wasted. Each component modification was small. Together, they were revolutionary. In late 1939, his modified supercharger was tested. The engineering team gathered in the concrete bunker test cell. Hooker stood behind armored glass, notebook in hand, looking calmer than he felt. The engine started. Boost pressure climbed beyond normal limits into red line zones. The engine kept running, singing smoothly. When they calculated the output, silence filled the room. 30% increase. Ernest Hives examined the data and smiled. Not much of an engineer, are you? Hooker would later use that quip as his autobiography's title. The Spitfire Reborn. The Merlin 45, incorporating Hooker's supercharger redesign, entered production in 1940. It was fitted into the Spitfire Mark V, which would become the most produced Spitfire variant of the war. Pilots immediately noticed the difference. The improved engine delivered substantially more power at medium altitudes, exactly where most combat occurred. Climb rate increased by roughly 1,500 feet per minute. Top speed jumped from 360 to 380 miles per hour. More critically, the Merlin 45 gave Spitfire pilots back their confidence. They were no longer flying underpowered aircraft against a superior enemy. Jeffrey Quill, Supermarine's chief test pilot, wrote that the Merlin 45 did more to prove the Merlin's development potential than any amount of technical forecasts. Pilots could feel the difference. Instructors at operational training units reported that new pilots pushed the Spitfire fee harder than they had dared with earlier marks because the engine responded with power that felt limitless. The ultimate triumph. But Hooker wasn't finished. In 1940, the Air Ministry requested an engine capable of high performance at 40,000 feet. They wanted it for a pressurized Wellington bomber, but the requirement would become critical for fighter operations within a year. Hooker was asked to consider turbocharging, which used exhaust gases to drive the compressor. He declined. Instead, he proposed something audacious, a two-stage supercharger. The concept was straightforward in theory. Instead of one supercharger compressing air in a single stage, use two superchargers in series. The first stage compresses the air partially. An intercooler cools it down between stages, increasing its density. Then the second stage compresses it further. The result? Massive amounts of air forced into the cylinders at altitudes where single-stage superchargers struggled. In practice, it was monumentally complex. Two superchargers meant two sets of impellers, two gear trains, a sophisticated intercooler, and a control system that could automatically shift between different gear ratios depending on altitude. The engineering team spent two years developing what became the Merlin 60 series, incorporating a two-stage, two-speed supercharger system. 
The Merlin 61 entered service in July 1942, fitted into the Spitfire Hornet 9. The timing was providential. The Luftwaffe had introduced the Focke-Wulf FW-190, a brutal fighter that outperformed the Spitfire Mark V at virtually every altitude. RAF squadrons were being mauled. Then, the Mark IX arrived. At 30,000 feet, it was 70 miles per hour faster than the Mark V. Its rate of climb exceeded anything Germany could feel. Suddenly, British pilots held the advantage at every altitude from sea level to 40,000 feet. The American Connection The two-stage Merlin's most famous application came in 1942 when Rolls-Royce sent a Merlin 61 to North America. The Americans had developed a beautiful fighter, the P-51 Mustang, but hobbled it with an inadequate Allison engine that performed poorly at altitude. North American Aviation's engineers installed the Merlin 61 as an experiment. The transformation was immediate and dramatic. The Merlin-powered Mustang became the long-range escort fighter that changed the strategic bombing campaign. It could accompany B-17 and B-24 bombers all the way from Britain to Berlin and back, a round trip of nearly 1,500 miles. Without the Mustang's protection, daylight bombing raids suffered catastrophic losses. With it, the 8th Air Force systematically destroyed Germany's industrial capacity. Packard Motor Company built over 55,000 Merlins under license in Detroit, applying American mass production techniques to Hooker's designs. The V1650-3, Packard's designation for the two-stage Merlin, equipped thousands of P-51Ds. Military historians argue that the Merlin-Mustang combination shortened the European war by six months to a year, saving hundreds of thousands of lives, all because a mathematician had trusted his equations enough to promise the impossible, the human cost. But this story demands honesty about the price of innovation pushed to its limits. Hooker's modifications extracted tremendous power from the Merlin, but they also operated engines at the edge of their design envelope. Most performed flawlessly, some did not. Engine failures over the English Channel and occupied Europe were every pilot's nightmare. When a Merlin seized or detonated in flight, pilots had seconds to react. Over water, ditching meant hypothermia within minutes. Over enemy territory, it meant capture or death. Hooker understood that every modification he proposed, every change he made to boost pressure limits or supercharger speeds carried this weight. His calculations could save Britain, but they could also send young men to their deaths if he was wrong. The pressure was immense. By 1941, Hooker was personally reviewing failure reports from operational squadrons, bearings that failed under increased loads. Supercharger components stressed beyond their original design limits. Each report represented not just mechanical failure, but human tragedy. Squadron commanders wrote letters describing pilots who didn't return. Hooker read those letters. He attended technical inquiries where engineers debated whether his modifications had pushed components beyond safe limits. What kept him working through sleepless nights wasn't just patriotism or professional pride. It was the mathematical certainty that his designs would save more lives than they risked. For every pilot who might suffer mechanical failure, hundreds more would survive combat because their engines gave them the performance edge they needed. But that calculation, however rational, never quite erased the burden of knowing that even rare failures meant real people died. His genius saved thousands, yet he carried the weight of those he couldn't save. The confidence he projected to Ernest Hives in 1939 was real, but it coexisted with a profound understanding of the stakes. Mathematics gave him power to transform the Merlin, but mathematics couldn't protect him from the human cost of operating at the edge of what was possible. The Jet Age Dawn. By 1941, Hooker understood that piston engines were approaching their limits. Then Ernest Hives introduced him to Frank Whittle, struggling to produce his revolutionary W-2 turbojet. Rover's manufacturing efforts were failing. Hooker saw immediately that his supercharger expertise applied directly to jet compressor design. The fluid dynamics were identical, just at higher speeds and temperatures. In 1942, at the Swan and Royal Pub in Clitheroe, Hives and Rover's Morris Wilkes arranged an extraordinary swap. Rover took over Rolls-Royce's tank engine production. Rolls-Royce took over the jet factory at Barnoldswick. Hooker delivered the Welland and Derwent engines that powered the Gloucester Meteor. His Nini turbojet briefly became the world's most powerful jet engine. Tragically, the British government licensed it to the Soviets, who reverse-engineered it into the Klimov VK-1 that powered MiG-15s over Korea. In 1949, Hooker moved to Bristol Aero Engines, where he designed the Olympus that powered both the Vulcan bomber and Concorde plus the Pegasus that enabled the Harrier's vertical flight. The man who perfected piston engines became the architect of Britain's jet age, the secret that never was. Imagine if Hooker had told the complete truth in January 1939, if he'd admitted his uncertainty, explained the risks, acknowledged that six months of work might prove his theories wrong. 
Would Hives have approved the project? Would skeptical senior engineers have killed it before it began? The Battle of Britain started in July 1940. The Merlin 45 entered production that October. Strategic historians calculate that Fighter Command came within two weeks of collapse in September 1940. Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding wrote that another fortnight of Luftwaffe pressure would have forced him to withdraw squadrons north, potentially making a German invasion viable. Hooker's modifications arrived precisely when Britain needed them, but that timing existed because he presented calculated risk as near certainty. He bridged the gap between mathematical confidence and engineering certainty through sheer force of will. In peacetime, this would be irresponsible. In 1939, facing Nazi Germany, it was necessary genius. Sometimes civilization doesn't permit the luxury of proof before action. Sometimes you must act on incomplete information because waiting for certainty guarantees defeat. Hooker understood that in existential crisis, confidence itself becomes a weapon as vital as the technology it enables. The legacy in metal. At the Royal Air Force Museum in Hendon, a polished Merlin sits in a glass case. The distinctive supercharger bulge, called the baby's bum, exists because of Hooker's calculations. Yet his name appears nowhere on the museum placard. Visitors walk past without realizing they're looking at mathematical genius-made metal. Early Merlins produced 1,000 horsepower. By 1945, final variants delivered over 2,000 horsepower from the same basic architecture. Hooker's initial 30% improvement proved radical transformation was possible. Over 160,000 Merlins were built during the war. They powered aircraft through over 1 million combat sorties, each mission depending on engines that worked because a mathematician trusted his equations. But Hooker's deeper legacy transformed engineering itself. Before him, engine design was empirical iteration. He proved mathematical modeling could predict results before cutting metal. His March 1941 report on predicting engine performance made public in 1997 became the foundation for modern computational design. Today's Rolls-Royce engineers designing Trent engines use computational fluid dynamics descended directly from methods Hooker pioneered in 1939. The Merlin's distinctive roar has become Britain's wartime anthem, but it's also the sound of equations made real, of one man's refusal to accept the impossible. If you were Stanley Hooker in January 1939, would you have made that promise? Would you have projected confidence you didn't entirely possess, secured resources based on untested calculations, and then worked desperately to prove yourself right? History doesn't give us the luxury of perfect information. Sometimes the most rational choice is to act on imperfect certainty, then make reality conform to your vision through sheer determination. Hooker's genius wasn't just mathematical ability, it was understanding that confidence must sometimes precede proof because waiting for proof means defeat. He chose to believe his equations could save Britain, then transformed that belief into metal that flew and fought and won. What audacious promise could you make today? What impossible problem might yield to the right equations, the right courage, the right calculated risk? The Merlin's roar still echoes across history, reminding us that sometimes genius means betting everything on mathematics, intuition, and the refusal to accept that something cannot be done. That's Stanley Hooker's legacy. Not just an engine, but a lesson in how civilization survives when brilliant people dare to promise the impossible, then deliver it anyway.